And I'm going to go by the order of service, so if it's not right, don't blame me. Okay? Um, and, I've, and I've been told right at the very start, the kids are going to come up and do their song, and then they're going straight over to Kids Reach over in the centre. So kids, it's your place. Come on right up here. here by the by the by the pan, pandemonium goes on okay guys thank you so much that was excellent i gotta tuck my shirt in now because it was because of Good. Okay, folks, um, now that the kids have, have gone off, and we know that they're practicing for, for uh, the nativity is going to come up in a couple of weeks, so that's the reason why they've gone off uh, early. Just now we're going to start with our opening hymn, and we're going to take the offering during this hymn, and our opening hymn is As the Deer Pants for the Water. So we'll stand, we'll offer our worship to God, both as we sing and as we give our tithes and offerings to his work.
Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Just now we're going to ask for God's blessing on our time together, so let's come together in prayer. Heavenly Father, right at the commencement of this service, we have been given some of a glimpse of who you are, that we were, we were, that we were uh, reminded by the kids' uh, song that you are the great big God who holds us in our hands, that you are the God who is our creator, that you are the God who, who, who is in control of all things, that you are the God who, um, who, that whenever you created us, you created us to have a living relationship with you. And Heavenly Father, we know that living relationship with you is involved in, in our worship of you, which we have just sung about, that as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you, as the psalmist wrote. And Heavenly Father, we do indeed thank you that, oh, this morning that our hope and our satisfaction and our meaning to life is found in who you are. That you are the God who, who sustains everything. That you are the God in which we find happiness, in which we, in which we find contentment, in which we find purpose and meaning to life. And Heavenly Father, we, but we realize this morning that that is not the way of the world. That the world today uh, is seeking it for its satisfaction and its meaning and its purpose in life and so many other things. So, Heavenly Father, we do thank you as well for your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who was rich yet for our sakes became poor, that through his poverty we might be made rich. We thank you, Heavenly Father, this morning that the way has been opened up, that for us who are sinful people, yet we can have our relationship with you restored. And that is through the life, the death, and the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Heavenly Father, in our thanksgiving this morning, we want to thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We want to thank you for your Son who has come to this earth and, and who has paid his price for our sins. Heavenly Father, we're also aware this morning that there's people that are not here um, who are maybe struggling at this time. And Lord, we just pray that you will just bless them where they are. Lord, we're also mindful of people who are facing massive challenges in life, who are facing difficulties in life, you're facing um, a, a period of uncertainty in life. And Lord, we just pray that you would be with them. And Heavenly Father, especially this morning, we, we would bring before you Nicole. Nicole, who is only 37, who is a young mom, I believe. And Lord, that she is facing this major cancer operation on Tuesday. Lord, we would pray, Lord, of you, Lord. And we would plead with you right at this particular time that as she's facing this massive mountain in her life, Lord, that she would find calmness and reassurance in who you are, that you are the God who's in control. And as we sung there this morning, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. Lord, our prayer would be, Lord, that our soul would long after you, that, that our soul would find peace in who you are, that you are the God who is, who is in control of all things. So, Lord, just be with Nicole, be with the whole family, Lord, as they face this difficult time um, right at this particular uh, point in their lives. Lord, we're also mindful for the pastor, for Jonathan, Lord, we thank you for him. Lord, as he preaches this morning over in, 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 uh, in Grace Baptist Church over in Tully Carnot, Lord, be with him. And Lord, this evening as he, as he, as he preaches in um, Ballysell Needham, Lord, we just pray that you be with him. And Lord, that he would know your anointing. Lord, as he speaks the words of life, Lord, that there, that there would be signs following the preaching of your word. So Lord, just be with Jonathan, Lord, be with us as we spend uh, this, these moments together. In your son's name and pray, amen and amen. Well, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm going to need to turn these lights on because no, I don't know. I, I don't care whether you can see me or not, but I can't see this. Hold on. Oh, good man. Good man. It's, uh, it's, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark Armstrong, and um, I have been involved in this church on and off for about 15 years. And um, uh, certainly it's wonderful to be uh, to have the opportunity to share God's word this morning. As I said in the prayer, Jonathan's away preaching in uh, Grace Baptist Church over in Tully Carnot this morning. There's a few announcements just I want to give at this particular time. Tonight at 6.30 is Life Explored. And we've been having wonderful times, well, at least I have, uh, with, the, with those who, 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 who gather there. And if you haven't been there yet, it's still not too late. Please come along and enjoy the fellowship, 
as we think about who God is. So um, again, that'll be on this evening at 6.30. Leads us to Tuesday night. Uh, we've got Teaching Tuesday and Communion, where Jonathan will be in charge of that service. Leads us to Wednesday morning, uh, 10.30 to 12, where the senior citizens will meet and where they will um, have their time of fellowship. Thursday morning, 11 to 12, is the hour of prayer, and that leads us to Friday evening, when the Friday night club now, the juniors will meet at 6.30, and then the seniors. Uh, I know that you are meeting in groups. I don't know what group's meeting this week, but I take it that you will know that. Um, Sunday, I'll lead us to next Sunday, where Jonathan once again will be in charge of the service at 11.30. And then at 1.30, there will be a dedication of a, of a, of a young child here and at 1.30 next Sunday. And that's all the announcements in which I have. Of course, they're all made in the will of the Lord. Uh, just now, we're going to sing once again, and we're going to sing one of my favorite hymns and uh, of all times, uh, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord. Of my heart. Once again, we'll stand as we offer our, our worship to God.
Amen. If you've got your Bibles with you, perhaps you would like to turn with me to uh, to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to read the first eight verses of 2 Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy, as what we will see in a few moments, is the last word and testament of Paul. Uh, we don't, um, this is the last time we hear Paul writing in scripture, and indeed as of what I'll allude to in a few moments, a few moments after this, or a few months after Paul writing this, Paul indeed would be dead. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to read the first eight verses. In the presence of God and of, G of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not want to put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I'm ready to be poured out like a drink offering. And the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just before we look at this passage, just come before the Lord again in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you indeed for the songs that have directed our mind and our thinking towards you this morning. And Lord, now as we spend these moments in your word, Lord, we just pray indeed, Lord, that you will give us ears to hear um, and, and hearts that would be willing to respond to your word. Lord, I am very aware of my limitations. Lord, I realize I can't cause an anxious thought. But Lord, I will do what I can and I will depend on you to do what I can't. And that is to challenge hearts. So Lord, we just open our hearts this time to your Holy Spirit to speak to us individually and collectively. Amen and amen. Now, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, you can hear me. That's good. Um, okay, I want to go to the next slide. What I'm going to do here just for a few moments, you're going to say, well, hold on. What's this boy? Is this guy going to sing? He's not going to sing. So it's, a, it's not a karaoke. Um, but we're going to look at just a few slides. It's going to really put into frame or into put a foundation into what we're going to look at this morning. Okay, next slide, thank you. What we have here is really a picture, a diagram of what the gospel is. Of course, or the gospel says that we are sinners, and because we are sinners, we are separated from a holy and righteous God. There's a great gap that is fixed between us. That is the reason why Jesus has come. Click, thank you. That's the reason why Jesus has come, and he has bridged the gap between sinful men and a holy and righteous God. That is the gospel, and the gospel never changes. It hasn't changed for the last 2,000 years, and we still declare the same gospel message today. I want to click again. Thank you. Now, what I want to do, I want to go back to 1971. That's 50. I was four years of age. That's 50 years ago. Um, so that makes me 54. I'll see if you're doing the miles, okay, and the whole thing. Okay, back in 1971, generally speaking, generally speaking, you want to click? Thank you. Generally speaking, people had an understanding of what the gospel was. And that understanding came from the 50s and the 60s, where people were sent to church and where kids were sent to Sunday school. Whether you wanted to go or not, you were sent, whether you, whether you thought it was a good idea or not, you were sent by your parents or, or your grandparents maybe. And even non-Christians would have came to Sunday school or would have came to church uh, so that the gospel services or the events that, were, that happened within churches were really the last link in the chain of event 
to bring somebody to Christ because they already knew the gospel. They already had that understanding of what the gospel was. So we could say there, you want to click again? Thanks, Gloria. At that stage, there was gospel knowledge, okay? People knew what the gospel was. And if you ask somebody who was born in the 50s and the 60s, what is the gospel? They'll give you a fair crack of what the gospel is. Okay, you want to click again? Thanks. Okay, I want to move now 20 years, okay? We're now moving up to 1991. People still, we're now into my era, so this is being brought up in the 70s and 80s. Um, and generally speaking, people still had gospel knowledge. They still knew what the gospel was. I remember whenever I was at school, whenever mods and rockers, a new wave movement, and all that sort of crazy stuff was going on in the 1980s, that whenever you asked the kids in my class, where did you go on a Tuesday night? At that stage, they were going to the Holborn Hall in Bangor. And they went there by the hundreds. So the kids still had a knowledge of the gospel. However, there was different um, obstacles that were now starting to appear that was diverting people's view away from the gospel. They no longer had a clear understanding of what the gospel is. Now, there's numerous of these. I'm just going to give you four. Okay, the first one. I put creation up there. What we really should have up there is evolution. Because by now, evolution had been taught in schools for a generation. And whenever evolution is taught in schools, what does it do? It tells us that God is not our creator. And therefore, if God is not our creator, then I have no responsibility to God because he's not my creator. So that was starting to undermine the gospel message. The next one, thanks, Gloria, was what we call the absentee landlord theory. And we were talking about this two weeks ago, actually, in, in Life Explored. And the absentee landlord theory is that God created this world, and he winded up like a big clock, and he just let it go, and he stepped back, and he no longer has any active part in the gospel, or no, no, no longer any active part in the world. So the world's just winding itself down. It's just winding itself down naturally. Now, at... Um, as a, as a result of that, whenever that theory is allowed to, to develop, well, this God is no longer actively involved in me. So this God doesn't care about my, my concerns, my problems, my trials, my difficulties in life. I want to throw the next one up. The next obstacle that came up, sexuality, which is really becoming a big one now. Because sexuality, um, what it does is it, it, it says that God, that if God is love and God loves me, he will not condemn me even though I don't operate inside his boundaries of what sexuality is. Now, I'm talking more about more than about gay, homosexual, lesbian. I'm talking as far as people living together outside of marriage. People moving, living outside the boundaries of what God has set, set them to do. That started to become a massive challenge within the church of the 1990s. The next one, the troubles. What was the troubles? Well, the troubles, people will turn around and say, was, a, was Protestant v. Catholic. That was not the problem. It was a territory war. Okay? However, from people outside or people looking at it, turn around and say, well, if Christians, and I'm putting them in inverted commas, if Christians can't get along together, I don't have anything to do with, with religion. So trouble started to become the problem. So that led us to, thanks, Gloria, once again, led us to what we call gospel knowledge, but there's no hindrances. People still know the gospel knowledge, still has knowledge of the gospel, but there's now these hindrances that are stopping people having a clear view. So the church had to start to negotiate, negotiate its way around these as it's talking to people. We're now having to talk about creation we never did before. We're having to talk about absentee landlord stuff, sexuality, um, the troubles issues and all the rest of it. So that leads us to the next slide. Thanks, Gloria. Okay. We're, we're right up to 2021. We're up to, to today. And this is where we are today. You'll notice that these, um, these barriers, these hindrances, have now taken the main stage. They're big now in people's lives. And because they're big in people's lives, it has pushed the gospel right into the margins of society, right onto the edges of society, and the peripherals of society. And this is what people think about today. Focus. And as a result of that, People have turned their back. They're no longer looking at the gospel. And if you talk to anybody under 30 years of age, you will be surprised about how little they actually know about the gospel. People, and actually, 
um, this summer in the in the CEF are doing their open airs, you know, their five-day clubs things with, with children. And um, they so they did it in Bangor, in Malile, in Ballywalter, in Port of Oge. And in every one of those five-day clubs, whenever they asked the children who were the first two people that lived on the earth, they couldn't tell them. They had no notion of what creation was. They had no notion that God is a creator, God. And that is in Northern Ireland, and that was in 2021. So that's showing that society today is pushing the gospel to its peripheral. And, the, what, the, and what the society is saying today is, you go to your little church and you do your little, your little religious thing. You do whatever you want on a Sunday morning, but you've got no right. You've got no right to tell me that I'm wrong. You have no right to tell me and challenge my lifestyle. And that is the gospel in which you and I live, or, or sorry, the society in which you and I live today, whether we want to admit it or not, which really leads us to ask a question. Thanks, Gloria, so much. Thanks so much for your help, Gloria. It was brilliant. But how does the local church... How does the local church operate or maintain balance in a gospel-ignorant society? How do you and I serve Christ in a society that is gospel ignorant? Because what really has drove this home to me, folks, and I don't want to be overly, uh, 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 well, I'm going to say it as it is. At Angela's funeral, where I was standing outside, Angela Brown's funeral, and I stood and I watched people, and there's about 700 people I think I counted outside at one stage. And I was just looking, and they were talking about everything, about football. They were talking about um, um, problems they were having. And not, not that I was being a snitch and doesn't know what they were saying. Um, they were talking about um, problems they were having. They were talking about everything. But there was no focus on what was going on in here. And folks, today, Shankill Road is a gospel-ignorant society. So how do we approach that? Well, as we will see that um, this is not unique to 21st century Shankle Road, but whenever we have those challenges, whenever we have those thoughts, whenever we bring those things to our minds, we must always come to the word, to the word of truth, which comes from the heart of God. And it's there we need to go and we need to go to find and to seek our comfort and direction. And that's what we find in 2 Timothy. Because in 2 Timothy, Paul was facing the same issues of gospel ignorance as we do today. Only it was in a completely different context. Paul, who had been used so wonderfully by God, who had, who had started, which I think was around about 20 churches, who had encouraged and who had built up scores and hundreds and thousands of Christians. And even though there had been major hindrances in his life, um, which, he had, which he had had to deal with, However, as we come to 2 Timothy chapter 4, all this blessing from God, all this um, work uh, in which uh, uh, Paul had been involved with, all seem to be in the past because Paul is now isolated, because Paul's alone in a prison cell, where the message of the gospel seemed to be completely irrelevant to those who were around him, where the Roman hierarchy had not only imprisoned Paul, and, and believed what he was saying was totally immaterial. But they were so opposed to what Paul was saying, as, that, as what I said earlier on, they were, at this particular point, they were, they were arranging his, his execution. And indeed, a few months, maybe even a few weeks, if we hold to the traditional view of 2 Timothy, Paul would be dead. And what we have here is Paul's plea to his young lieutenant, Timothy, and how to maintain biblical balance why Paul himself was being exposed to a gospel-ignorant society. And there's just four very quick statements that Paul makes to Timothy in how to maintain balance in the face of gospel ignorance that I trust will bring you encouragement and challenge at the same time today. Statement number one, keep focused. Verse one of 2 Timothy 4, in the presence of God, and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and the view of his appearing on this kingdom, I give you this charge. The word charge here that is used in verse 1 
It's really a legal term that refers to testifying in court in front of a judge. In the Roman court system where Paul was facing at this particular time, the judge had the supreme authority to pass sentence where either he could declare you innocent and give you life, or he could declare you guilty and remove your life. He could spare your life and give you a future, or he could demand your life and give you no future. So in the courtroom, if you like, all eyes would be fixed on the judge. He was the one who had to be pacified. He was the one who had to be satisfied. He was the one in which you had to keep your eye on. And the scene that what Paul is alluding to here, as he writes to Timothy, he is charging Timothy that, is, that in his service and his work uh, is being played, that, that it is being played out in full view of the courts of heaven, where Christ is sitting as the judge of all ages. The declaration from Paul to Timothy is to remember that the judge is watching. So don't forget to give him your full attention. Because he's the one, he's the one who's going to bring everything to a conclusion. Oh, there might be those who we see in verses 3 and 4 might think that the judge is a foolish judge. Those who will have their own ideas, who will suit their, suit their own desires, who will, if you like, turn away from biblical truth. But the judge in his time and in his way, for his glory, will bring all proceedings to a close one day where the focus to the gospel, where the, where the fools to the gospel will be exposed for exactly who they are, fools. Where at, where at that time, the judge will give mercy to whom he gives mercy to. But also, he is the judge who has the sword of judgment that will fall on those who have, who, have a, who have ignored his who who he is. So for Timothy, it was imperative not to be distracted, to keep his focus on the judge because the judge is watching and he will make his proclamation one day. The charge that Paul declared to Timothy is the exact same charge that comes through the centuries to us here this morning in the 21st century. We are to keep our eyes on Christ our judge, despite of the environment we might face, despite of the opposition we might face, and despite of the gospel ignorance in which we live. Because ultimately, there is a day coming whenever we will stand before the judge and we will give an account of our lives to him. For the, for the Christian, our judgment in that day will not be regarding where we will spend eternity because that's already been settled at the cross. But as the merciful judge, who, who not only gives us purpose and meaning in this life, but in that life, he will give us a crown of righteousness in the future, as we see in verse 8. That is, we will stand before the judge, and he will declare us eternally righteous. And that, declar that declaration of him declaring us eternally righteous is the core of where we will spend eternity with him or not. Will he declare us eternally righteous or not? Where we will have, for the, where for the Christian, we will have a full realization of the righteousness that Christ has offered to us. So for in Paul's time and in our time, uh, where Christians might be seen as irrelevant, where being a Christian might be even be seen as being homophobic or whatever, or strange or, queer, or, or crazy or whatever, there is a time coming that in this time, whenever the world's judgment of us will be overturned by the, by the great judge who will declare us eternally righteous. So in difficult times and in good times, we must keep our focus on him. In these times, there is a need for the local church to be focused in Christ and not to be distracted by the world's thinking. So the first statement that Paul passes to Timothy for the local church is to keep focused on Christ. The second statement from Paul to Timothy is keep relevant. Whenever I use the word relevant here, I'm referring how the local church 
is to declare the gospel to the local community, even though the, the local community is gospel ignorant at that time. And we really see how that happens in verse 2, where he writes, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Notice that the church's declaration of the gospel to society is primarily through the preaching of the word. Preaching was the primary way to, con to counteract the false teaching that was going on in verses 3 and verse 4. And still today, preaching is the primary God-given tool in the church's armory to challenge the foolishness of a gospel-ignorant society. So for just for a few moments, let's look at that phrase, that phrase, preach the word. First of all, they were to preach. Now, whenever you and I think about preaching, you know, we'll think, our mind's eye will go to someone who's standing in the pulpit in front of a congregation with an open Bible and a few notes and will be declaring. And without a doubt, the church needs godly preachers who are faithful to scripture truth. And thank God you've got one of those in Jonathan. He is faithful to the word. However, that word for preaching here, the original word is the word caruso. Um, and that caruso means to herald a message on the behalf of the king. And that's what the responsibility of the one standing in the pulpit is. That is my primary responsibility, responsibility this, this morning, is to declare a message, from, not just from a king, but from the king of kings. There's a, there's a desperate need today for unapologetic explanation of the scriptures where the words of life are declared to the local congregation. However, the word preaching goes further than, if you like, the corporate, the pulpit, the public declaration of God's word. It also refers to individuals speaking to individuals. If we go back to the original um, focus of the original word, the word caruso, the message of the king was also, it also needed to be re relayed on a one-to-one -one basis. So in preaching, if you like, there's the public side of preaching, but there's also the personal one-to-one -one side of preaching. And in, I guess in that context, all Christians are called to be preachers. We're all called to speak the words of life to those who we engage with. It's not just up to the expert on a Sunday morning. Being, a, being an evangelistic church is just not up to whether um, Jonathan preaches here on a Sunday and what he preaches. An evangelistic church is also lies on what we do whenever we go out into the world. It's up to you and me to engage to those who we engage with. We're called to be preachers to the other side of our street. We're called to be preachers maybe to the other side of our room. Where we, where we will tell those who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ has done for us. I think because we're living in a gospel-ignorant culture where people are no longer coming to churches, people are no longer coming to gospel events or whatever, there's this increasing need in my mind for you and me to go to them. There's a greater emphasis, if you like, on one-to-one on -one evangelism where time needs to be spent building relationships with an individual so that we can explain the gospel to them, so that we can explain the gospel around the different obstacles in which we've seen a few moments ago on the diagram. There's a need to spend time breaking down the barriers of the false notions which people have today of the gospel and explain to them exactly what the gospel actually is. Folks, and welcome Evangelical Church. My plea to you this morning is, this community desperately needs you to be their friend to them. To spend time chatting with them. Where as you talk about the gospel, as the opportunity arises, and as you pray for them, that, they're, that, they, will turn, that they will slowly turn around to see what the gospel actually is. And that they will put their trust in Christ. I know a friend, a good friend of mine, who is actually a farmer. And a vet very regularly would have came onto the, onto the farm to look at the animals. 
And God really placed the soul of this vet really on the heart of my Christian farmer friend. And over a period of years, I think it was 15 years, not every time he came onto the farm, but where the opportunity arose, he would have talked about Christ. And he would have talked about the gospel. And slowly, 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 this, this vet started to see the gospel for what it was. And just about four or five months ago, that vet put his, put his faith in Christ. It took 15 years working with him. And here, Paul is called, Paul's calling Timothy, and he's also calling you and me to go to our neighbor, to go, our, to go to our friend, and go to our colleague who desperately needs us to come and be a preacher, to be a teller of the good news of the gospel to them. So Paul tells Timothy to preach, but what is he to preach? Well, he's to preach the word. And Timothy was charged under Christ the judge to preach the word. Simply, he was to preach biblical truth. He was not to add to it or to take away from it, but he was just to preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. He was just to, he was just to be faithful to, 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 to scripture truth. And I think that's where maybe some people shy away from one-to-one evangelism because they, they're not clear in their mind regarding the essential truths. Now, we don't all need to have a PhD in theology, but we all should have a working knowledge of what the gospel is. That's what Life Explored, part of what Life Explored is about on a Sunday night. It's getting the gospel clear in our minds, what it, what it exactly is, so that whenever the conversation does arise with the gospel ignorant, we know what we believe in and why we believe it. Our knowledge of essential truth will allow us to take that conversation, whenever it arises, and allow it allow it to take it down the road of the gospel. So there's a need to study God's word, to understand God's word. And there's many tools out there to help us to do that. So we see that the church is balanced by keeping focused, keeping focused in Christ. We notice that the church remains balanced by keeping relevant through the preaching of the word. But third statement of Paul makes to Timothy is that we are to keep active but you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. And Paul in his declaration to Timothy and through the Holy Spirit to us here states that there needs to be a distinct difference between the society in which we live in and who we are as Christians. And that comes, that comes very clearly in that first statement in which Paul makes to Timothy in verse 5, but you. In verses 3 or 4, Paul heights, highlights the perversion of letting worldly ideas infiltrate the church, which had resulted in the misalignment of biblical truth. But you, Timothy, he says, but you, Timothy, you're to be actively different. Where not only are you to be active in the presenting of the gospel, but you must be proactive in dispelling the myths that, that undermine the gospel. It was John Calvin who once wrote, the more determined men become to despise the teaching of, teachings of Christ, the more zealous should the godly be to assert it, and the most strenuous their efforts to preserve its entire. And one of the great tragedies, I think, today, within the churches in, in, in the UK, I'll put it like that, is the effort in which the church makes to be accepted by the world, where, they, where worldly ideas infiltrate their way into the life of the church, and as a, as a result of that, it confuses the people outside the door because they can't see any difference between what the church is and what they are. You and I are called to be different. You and I are called to be, to, to be Christians in a gospel-ignorant society. You and I are called to show the difference in which Christ makes to a life. And we are to be actively different in how we approach situations in life. And Paul here lists a number of situations where Christ can, where Christ should be shining through us. First of all, he says, keep your head in all situations. That phrase, keep your head in all situations, really means keep, keep a sober head, keep a sober, sober mind in all situations. In other words, don't react to situations the way the world reacts to situations. React in a different way. React in a Christ way. We also see that we're to be actively to pre prepared to endure hardship. 
Being faithful to the gospel will always respond. The response to it will, will always possibly be that we will experience or we will endure hardship. Because, and the reason why that is is because the gospel cuts, a, cuts across society's fallen notion of what life is. Where people generally think that I can make my life better. Where the gospel says we can't make our life better, so we look away from ourselves and we look to Christ because he's the one in whom we put our trust in, realizing that we can't help ourselves. Therefore, these opposing views will always cause a confrontation. But there might be a cost to following Christ. It might cost a friendship. It might cost a job promotion. It might cost financial. It might cost something. But taking up the cross and following Jesus Christ is not up, is not up for negotiation. It is a basic command from the chief shepherd to us that we're to take up our cross, we're to, wor we're to work out and, and pay the cost of following Christ. I met a, a pastor from Myanmar quite a while ago now who said to me whenever I said, said to him, how can we pray for you? He said to me, please do not pray that we will be freed from our, from our hardships for the gospel because we don't want to be like the Southwestern Christians. Pray that we will endure the hardship because that will make us mature in Christ, in our Christian faith, so that, we will, so that we will be able to defend the gospel despite the cost. Don't pray. In other words, he said, don't pray that our life will get easier. Just pray that we will be able to endure it. What a challenge. What a challenge to us this morning. Are we willing to pay the price for the gospel? Are we willing to tell that neighbor, risking that a could be fired back at us that risk that they might dismiss us because of it Paul also commands Timothy to be active in evangelizing and that word evangelizing is really two words, really comes from two words it means to act, a messenger who acts well and the call to him is be a messenger who acts well, that word evangelism is okay, it might be said to Timothy here or being an evangelist might be said to Timothy here, but effectively we could all put our name in it. Mark, be a good evangelist. Mark, be a good messenger. Put your name in that. Be an evangelist. Be a good messenger. And we notice that, say at the end of verse 5, we are to discharge all our duties of our ministry, where his declaration to Timothy is, Despite the opposition, despite the discouragements, despite the heartaches, Timothy, don't give up what Paul, what, what God has called you to do. Because the prize is great. The crown of righteousness is waiting. And in these days where it's increasingly difficult for a church to operate, where the, where the, dis, where the discouragements weigh out the encouragements, if you like, 10 to 1. And there's so many reasons to give up. Yet Paul calls us through the Holy Spirit not to give up. Don't give up doing what you're doing. There is a work for Jesus only you can do. Tis the master's, um, tis the task the master just for you has planned. Hasten to his bidding, yield his servants true. There's a work for Jesus only you can do. The last statement that Paul makes to Timothy is keep investing. And as I've indicated, Paul was right at the end of his time on earth. His time on earth was drawing very quickly to a close and he was about to be executed. And at this time, Paul was suffering. He was suffering physically. You'll see further on in verse, uh, in chapter four, it says, bring the cloak. He was cold. He was suffering spiritually. He says, bring the parchment. If you like, bring my Bible. He was suffering psychologically because he is remembering those people who has done him harm. Paul is suffering at this point. But yet, despite of his suffering, in his last few paragraphs of his last letter to Timothy, he's still pouring his life into the next generation, where this young lieutenant would now be equipped and trained to continue the work in which Paul had started. And almost Paul's last words to Timothy in verse 7 is, Timothy, fight the fight. 
because the gospel is worth fighting for. Finish the race. Paul, Timothy, keep going to the end and keep the faith because it's worthwhile whenever we think about what Jesus Christ has done for us. As I look out here this morning, I'm going to be very gentle whenever I say, and I say this as I close. There are several of us who are in the second half of our lives, maybe in the final third of our lives. And the example here from Paul to Timothy is to invest in those who are coming behind us. Pour your life into them. Pour your life into those kids because they're part of the gospel in our society. Pour your life into them. Pour your life into your children. Pour your life into those young people in your street or whatever, or, or into the Friday night club or whatever. Pour your life into Pour your life into the next generation. Invest in them. Encourage them to fight the fight because it is worth fighting. Encourage them to keep, to keep the faith because it's worth keeping. Encourage them to finish the race. Invest in them so that the church will be balanced and steadfast as she faces the people of the next generation. So, so in keeping the church balanced in a gospel ignorant society, we're to keep focused, keep our focus on Christ. We're to keep relevant. Be willing to engage in one-to-one -one evangelism. We're to keep active. Keep on doing what you're doing. Don't give up. And we're to keep on investing in the next generation. We're going to close with a hymn, and the hymn is Jesus Pet It All, All to the I.O.
I just want to give you one word of encouragement, just in case you were discouraged about living a gospel ignorant society. Today, um, the stats are sitting that in the, in this 24 hours, 174,000 people will come to faith in Jesus Christ somewhere in the world. That means in the last hour in which we've been here, 7,400 people have come to faith. 4,000 churches are started every week. That means in the last hour we've been here, 24 new churches have been planted. Be encouraged. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do indeed thank you for your word, Lord, and we thank you indeed, Lord, that you have called us to this time, this particular moment in time. And though, Heavenly Father, at times we can be discouraged as uh, there is this apathy towards the gospel message of your Son, Jesus Christ, yet we are encouraged that the church is being built, that Christ is building his church, and that he is gathering together people from every tribe and tongue and nation and language and, and, and people who will worship the Lamb on the throne. And in that day, in that day, there will be people from the Shanko Road. There will be people who were influenced by this church, that there will be people who were influenced by the people in this church. And Lord, we just pray indeed, Lord, that you will just encourage them as they keep moving forward. And Lord, indeed, Lord, this place will continue to be a light in, the, in a dark place. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.